There's a few things in life that age like a fine wine. The Datsun 240Z, so beautiful, so capable of being a fire hazard. They are. Then you've got a 67 Camaro, no doubt an absolute heater of a car. Another one, fine wine. Never had it, but seems appropriate considering the analogy that we made and everybody else seems to say it, so I'm assuming it's pretty good. I prefer the bagged wine, the one that you slap that bad boy and pass around in a capping chair and pray that you don't lose your little Caesar's pizza that's trying its best to absorb the trash that you drank for the last six hours. Either way, there are cars, parts, and wines apparently, and movies even, that age like a fine wine. What are you doing to that whole- And today we're gonna talk about one of those brands that I believe have done that before, even though no one seems to talk about it like ever, it's just one of those things that has disappeared from the limelight. It's the acid rain of 2012. It's the, I'm not entirely sure, okay? I'm Alex, Alex at FI on Instagram, and today we're gonna be diving into the history. Some might even say truth about the history of Veilside. Before we get started, drop one thing that you know about Veilside in the comment section below or something that you want us to read or understand or ask about or learn about in the next video. We're gonna try and bring back a little bit of this. And if you haven't heard of Fitment Industries before, we started this to talk about all things related about aftermarket cars as we found it damn near impossible to find what fit our cars when it came to wheels, tires, or suspension, which is kind of the whole thing that we did. So we made a ginormous gallery where you can enter in your remake model and find out what fits your car and buy it either through the straight cold hard cash or if you need a firm so you can buy it now and pay it later you can do that we don't really judge but if you got a cool car at least add it to the gallery that'd be like the one thing i would ask for stop scalping max it's still on your screen you're the reason i can't get a ps5 i shouldn't need to try to buy something i should it should just be available not available Veilside is the name of the game when it comes to Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. And it was the reason that many people likely found love with the FD RX-7, even though mostly nobody knew it was an RX-7 until the actual production company said it was, because the kit removed approximately 95% resemblance from the stock body, which is something Veilside actually does. Either way, Veilside Co. LTD was originally founded in 1990 by a man named Yoko Maku Hirano. The name, Veil Side, can be broken down into Veil and Side. Yoko from Yoko Maku, which means side, and Maku, meaning Veil, like a Veil, Veil Side. It's his name. It's pretty catchy, actually. Okay, so Mr. Yoko Maku, I'm trying not to mess this up, started this company initially not based on any sort of body kits, actually, but performance tuning. It had nothing to do with body kits of any time. Located near the classic, oh gosh, Tuscuba circuit, race course. Yokomaku would spend time using the startup business years, helping others with tuning adjustments for their race cars to funnel into his own passion of racing cars. That was it. Just like a lot of the companies that from overseas and in Japan, they fueled their business to fuel their passion for racing. And for those that don't know, Bellside was not just known for having fast cars. They weren't just known for having quick spirited vehicles, okay? They were known for having some of the fastest rocket ships known to man. Like in the history of the world, they had some of the fastest cars ever, like gnarly quick. So much so that people knew them for this like record breaking thing, okay? They initially started developing body kits to help with drag and allow their very insane cars to stay connected to the road. And Bill said was making mothers cry with vehicles like their BNR 34 that broke the street world record of 340 kilometers per hour, which is 211 miles per hour back in the day on street tires. They had a JZA80 Super with 1200 horsepower with a top mounted turbo, large core intercooler, and there was relocated radiator to the rear with a snorkel that looked at it give Taco Bell a little run for its money, okay? The thing was huge. You put a child in that thing. It was really funky looking, but it was quick. It was extremely fast. But the start was 100% tuning till about 1993 when they began unofficially making aero parts for their car's performance and actually selling them out to people that wanted them, which a lot of people did. They got the official authorization in July of 1995, but hey, tomato, tomato. All right, they began making aero parts in 1993 because that's when he said it did. But it was for the overall change of the car, meaning that Mr. Yokomaku wanted to make their cars to be a complete performance package. They wanted to do everything, tuning, aero, wheels, tires, suspension, but not from fitmentindustries.com because it was in 1993. But hey, the man's got a taste and an idea and I respect that. That was the vision. And so to, for him to do it all, 
he needed to be able to source it all. And it started off really well for them because their name was already known for their performance. Everybody just picked up their body kits because they thought that that's what they needed to do. But what started as a total transformation and what they wanted to do with every customer began to turn into people just requesting to buy just the body kits, just those pieces. Damn millennials in their want to only have aesthetic parts. Okay, this actually happened back in the 90s, okay? So calm your shit. Over time, the tuning images of Vale's side started to slowly go away from just performance and go towards body kits. But Vale's side kept pushing into the performance and racing perspective of their brand for as long as they could, specifically considering that the owner really just did all that other stuff to fuel their racing heritage. Veilside would introduce their very own throttle bodies, their own coilovers, their exhaust systems, wings, and all that funky thick with a two C's and probably a K arrow. Over time, Veilside's image became something people wanted to have. And as cars began to be released during the pinnacle of JDM performance sports cars, which is like 1992 to 1997, Veilside would be a brand or the, the brand many turned to for a crazy modification list. And it was pretty expensive. I mean, it wasn't cheap by any means, but people paid it. Veilside would go through the years using the president's vision for each body kit, using a pretty basic process. He'd grab some clay, hand lay the kit on a car to the way that he wants, and then they would just, that would be the whole thing. I'm very excited because they have or had a Veilside Ferrari kit, which was freaking awesome. What the hell? You never see that, no Tokyo Drift, but uh, whatever. As the years went on, Veilside ultimately grabbed the attention of people across the water that were beginning to truly become infatuated with JDM design and heritage. This was becoming a really big thing as we get further into the 90s and into the early 2000s. Veilside would begin to handle the full array of aftermarket components for the Toyota Supra, the Mazda RX-7, the Subaru Impreza, the Mitsubishi FTO, and even the Mitsubishi Evo, some Porsche models, BMW, and even a touch of Italian cars in there like the Ferrari. There's quite a bit of love for Veilside in the Fast and Furious series as well, which is probably what spawned a lot of the continued interest in the domestic world. You'd see the family man. Wait, family, family. Vin Diesel. On the Veilside RX-7. Suki's uh, S2000 and Too Fast Too Furious for the short screen time. Tokyo Drift had a Veilside RX-7, obviously. The STI in the fourth one had a Veilside body kit. Fast Five, it's in there. Nearly every single movie has a Veilside car in it. It's like an Easter egg game. Go try and find them all. The Veilside name would introduce Veilside USA models and all that sort of stuff within Veilside USA, such as the D1 GT kit, the Combat Series, the Fortune kit, and so many more, especially as they started to open their borders to try and sell to everyone across the world. As the years progress, the body kits will continue to remain extreme, capturing the wants and needs of those that bought anything from Veilside. VIPs and celebrities wanted something unique, excessive, and completely out of taste without needing all the performance stuff. So over time, Veilside entertained that and they did make things that were just completely wonky and just out of this world. Veilside would make an H2 Hummer and Bentley conversions for the JZA80 Supra. I mean, they did that. That's a real thing. If you want nightmares, go look it up. I mean, they did quite a bit of just really weird stuff. And after that, Veilside really just kind of fell off the map. Ah, oh but we're not here just to talk. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. That's the wrong. <clears throat> that's the wrong series. So what happened? Veilside was the first to make a bomb shaped muffler made from round pipe. If you guys ever noticed back in the past, that was a huge thing, especially in the early 2000s, that your muffler was designed a certain way. Veilside like coined that design. That design element was Veilside's thing. They built 1400 horsepower cars like nobody's business that could run eight on street tires. Now I say street tires and I know sometimes they ran drags, but for the most part, a lot of their records were made with street tires. All right. They even audited those that bought these cars to make sure that they could handle it. They had iconic racers like Tetsuya Kawasaki running their cars. They had the fastest R32 on street legal tires. You know how hard that is to do on street legal tires? You know how much easier it is when the rubber is just strictly made to melt onto asphalt? They didn't do that. They ran like some nittos or something. Well, they're still making body kits, but it's just not as crazy as it once was. And I don't mean in the design because some of Veilside stuff is still pretty nuts. They have some still very ridiculous stuff out there that was like super cool then and we're not so sure about now. They're one of the first to the over fender wide body games. 
hands down. And in addition, what made Veilside so unique was just how much they changed on the car that practically made it look nothing like the original car, save for the roof. This was something that they were very, very proud of. But as of the 21st century, and as that whole very interesting century rolled in and rolled through. The design cues outside of likely the RX-7 Fortune Kit dated pretty dang hard, all right? And the days of wanting a full body over transformation were replaced with people just simply wanting over fenders. After that, it was over fender kits, but the kits still retained some of the OEM look with just more aggressive body styling that was more wedge styled like a good old block of cheese, narrower in the front and wider in the rear. If you look at kits these days, this is what they do. Veilside didn't do that. Veilside did this. And it's just wide, absolutely everywhere. And while the kits were initially made for function, and rightfully so, that styling really didn't meet the same hearts of enthusiasts in the late 2010s as it did for those in the late 90s and early 2000s. And over time, their heritage couldn't meet up with the demand of people and the companies that were now coming into the fray to offer similar things, but with a more trendy style. Regardless of the current performance of Veilside, the company itself stands for something truly special in the Japanese aftermarket community. I mean, when you really look at it, I mean, Hirano didn't like to use a stroked engine because he feels like the engine's character is lost. He just didn't enjoy doing it. So all of his cars were tried to be based off of the RB stock platform. He enjoyed the RB's peakiness and high revving engine style. It's his thing. While he understands it, he still prefers a high revving car and he doesn't want to stroke the motor out any more past that to lose that soul. It's just a very respectful thing. And it's the same thing with street tires. He runs them on street tires because it's his thing. This seems to be a common occurrence with these brands, especially brands that are over in Japan. And I think this is why a lot of the reason people absolutely love them. It's based on a principle that keeps them making what they love, regardless of the trends that seem to edge either for or against whatever it is that they're doing. They held a pillar of the aftermarket community and are likely one of the main reasons so many aftermarket body part companies exist to this day. Their kits inspired thousands, if not tens of thousands of people to want an RX-7. And they traveled the world breaking records, which is something that most, if not any automotive driving enthusiast would just love to do. They built a name and it's one of those names that carried the success for people like you and people like me in 2020 to enjoy JDM cars. And so for that, Veilside gets a warm W in my heart could also be coffee. But what do you think about Veilside? Worth it or not? Let us know below. And if you're looking for aftermarket wheels, tires, or suspension, be sure to let us know, or be sure to check us out over at fitmanindustries.com. I think that I, I'm right. <clears throat> okay, well, I'm Alex from Fitman Industries. We'll see you later.